know your outcome. If you're going to succeed at anything, it's hard to succeed, hard to hit a target when you don't know what it is. And as simplistic as this sounds, do, no, do most people really know what they want? What do you think? Yes or no? At least not consciously they don't, right? And so it's going to be very, very difficult to achieve what you want when you haven't defined it. But this is going to become a question we're going to want you to ask yourself a lot. What is my outcome in this situation? I even have a time management system that I developed. It's really a life management system, which we call OPA, because the first O stands for what's my outcome. Because you can come up with a question like, what should I do? And you're going to end up with a long list. But as you do all these things, what will happen is you can cross something off your list and still be unfulfilled and not really achieve anything that matters. So you'll say, what's my outcome first? Then you begin to decide what you need to do to get the outcome. So in this case, we want to say, what's your outcome? You want to make it a habit to ask this question a lot. You're in the middle of a conversation. Stop yourself if it seems to go nowhere and say, what's my outcome here? Do I want to connect? Do I want to influence this person? Do I want to learn something? What's your outcome? For example, how many of you have ever been caught up in an argument and you even forgot what you're arguing for, but you knew you had to win? How many have been there? Say I. Okay, if in the middle of that argument you were to ask yourself the question, what's my outcome here? I guarantee you your brain would say, well, my outcome is not to fight. My outcome is to resolve this. And as you get clear on what your real target is, your behavior will change automatically. So very, very few people know what they want. And the more you clear you can get about what you want, the more you can really achieve. So might right underneath this is the subset of number one, still number one, just like clarity is power. Clarity is power. The more clear you can become about what it is you really want, the more power you're going to have. Because your brain is like a servo mechanism in a, a bomb, as an example. When they send a missile out. It has a servo mechanism. It knows what the target is. And when the target moves, it follows it. Well, your brain is very similar. When you decide exactly what it is you want, you start picking up information that you never would have picked up before consciously. For example, have you ever bought a particular car maybe, or maybe a certain outfit, and then all of a sudden you see that car or outfit everywhere? How many have had that experience? Say I. Well, was that car or outfit already around you all the time? Yeah, but you didn't notice it because there's a portion of your brain that it was responsible for one thing, and that is screening out 99% of what you see, hear, and feel in life. Because if you were to notice everything that's going on in this room right now, you go start craving mad. But most of you don't. You pay attention to a small number of things. If you could right now notice what? Millions of things. You could notice my voice. You could listen to what I'm saying. You could notice what's going on in the background, the screens. You could hear the air conditioning. You could smell your neighbor off to all that jumping up and down and notice that. Right? You could feel that maybe a little sweat trickling across your chest or whatever was going on after all that jumping up and down. You could feel the blood maybe vibrating or circulating through your left eardrum. But you don't think about those things until maybe I mention them or something triggers it. So this part of our brain that's responsible for deleting most of our thoughts and most of the things that are going on around us, that part of our brain, when, you know, when it knows what you want, it makes you notice those things. You suddenly see that car because it's important. It's called the reticular activating system. You don't have to write all that down. For short, it's called RAS. The reticular activating system tells your brain what to pay attention to. So when you say, this is what I really want, now anything that relates to that that you wouldn't have noticed before will start popping up into your focus. And a lot of times people say, it's amazing. I decided this, and it was kind of you know, synchronicity. These things started popping up. Well, these things were probably around you before, but you never noticed them because you hadn't decided your outcome. Now, when you know your outcome, you're ahead of 95% of the population. But that's not enough. The second thing you got to know is a lot of times you know your outcome, but you lose your drive. You know, you want something, but you forget the most important thing, which is know why you want it. Know why you want it. You got to know the purpose. In our OPA training system, when people are managing their lives, we have them ask, what's my outcome? And then why do I want this? Because any person successful, really successful, knows exactly what they want and they know why. The reason you don't know why is, remember I said yesterday, reasons come first, answers come second. If you get enough reasons, you can get a big enough why, you can figure out how to do about anything. But you've got to have purpose, because purpose provides drive. Now, if you know what you want and you know why, you're light years ahead of most of the population, but you've got to go to the step that most people seem to avoid. And that is you've got to take massive what? That's right. And the key word there is massive. Massive action can be a cure-all when you know what you're after, and you know why you want it. Because when you know what you're after, when you take action, you won't just be expending energy. You'll be moving yourself in a direction towards something you really, really want. 
And by the way, last night we called taking massive action personal what? Power, which means the ability to take action. And what stops people from taking action? Primarily what? Fear. And the way you get over that fear is, what do you think is the number one fear most people have? Failure. And the reason is they feel if they fail, they won't be loved. They'll be rejected. They'll be hurt. They'll be judged. So what they really are afraid of is losing love. And they think that this rejection, or I should say this failure, will lead to that rejection or loss of love. The truth of the matter is, you can't fail unless you don't try. If you try something that doesn't work, you just learn from it, and that'll make you better the next time you go about it. Now, if you know your outcome, know why you want it, and take massive action, you're now in the most small percentile of people on the planet. So what's the next step, though? Well, you can take a lot of action and get caught up in a pattern. Like, become so determined that you became like tunnel vision. Like, I know this is going to work. And so you keep running east, looking for a sunset with total certainty and a lot of belief, high standards, still doesn't work. So what you have to be able to do to succeed so you don't get caught up in some old pattern is you've got to know what you're getting. Know what you are. Know what you're getting. The word we use for this as for short is we call it sensory acuity. Sensory acuity is the idea that you want to become acutely sensitive to whether what you're doing is working or not. You don't want to just say, okay, I know what I want, I know what I want, and I'm just going to make it happen, this is how I'm going to do it. And you keep hammering it, hammering it, hammering it, doing something that doesn't work. And people do this all the time, right? Do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. That's called insanity. You can't do the same thing again and again, expect a different result, when you can see it doesn't get the result. But we get caught up in our patterns. So we want to get really sensitized, acutely sensitized, sensory acuity, to whether what we're doing is working or not. And by the way, sensory acuity is really the measure of a person's intelligence. What I mean by that is how do we measure intelligence? Intelligence is a measure of the number and quality of distinctions you have in a given situation. Like for example, if you talk to Eskimos, that's actually not the politically correct term anymore, I guess it's in a way. If you talk to an in a way, what we formerly called Eskimos, you'd find out that in a way have more than a dozen words for the word snow. More than a dozen. Now, I'm from Southern California. Guess how many words I have for snow? <laughs> One. I don't see any of it. It's called snow, baby. Right? But they got to know what kind of snow. They got to make more refined distinctions to be effective in the world, to get their outcomes. They got to know what kind of snow you can build an igloo out of, what kind of snow you can take your dogs through, what kind of snow you can eat, right? what kind of snow you're going to fall through. So who has more intelligence, who has more power in that snowy environment, the Eskimo or me? Which one? Eskimo, because they have more sensory acuity. They have more refined distinctions about what each of these elements mean versus I just see it as snow. Now, if you took that Eskimo and you stuck him in my car in Los Angeles, then we'd find out that maybe I have a little more intelligence because he might try to steer the thing using the rearview mirror. Right? He just doesn't know. So since he doesn't have that acuity, he doesn't have those distinctions, he wouldn't do terribly well there. See, some people I could hold this up and I could say, what is this? And they'd say, well, it's a cylinder. Other people say, no, no, that's a blue, white, and black cylinder. Someone else says, no, no, that's a blue color marker. A few people say, no, 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 that's not just a blue color marker. That is a pilot, super color, bright and wide color marker. And if you get it in your clothes, it'll never come out. Now, which one of those people has more power? One, two, three, or four? Four, because they have the largest number of distinctions. So now, if you know your outcome, you know why you want it. You got your purpose. You got your drive. You got your A and OPA. This is outcome, purpose, action. You know the massive action. You're taking action. And you notice if it's working. What happens if you notice it's not working? You're taking action, but it's not getting you closer to your outcome. What's the obvious fifth step? The fifth step is change your approach. Change your approach. If what you're doing, your cutie says, is not working, change it. Now, what if you change your approach and that's still not working? Then what would you do? What would you do? Come on, what would you do? Change it again. Keep yourself in a peak state. Sit up in your chair. Some of you have gone back into that deep hypnotic state of learning, I can see. And what if you tried that and it didn't work? Then what would you do? What if that doesn't work? What do you do? And what if that doesn't work? What do you do? What if that doesn't work? What do you do? What if after all that it still doesn't work? What do you do? And what if you try that and it doesn't work? How many times? Until you find out what works. Do not say to yourself, I've tried everything. That's bull. If you tried everything, you'd have what you want. Well, I haven't tried everything, but I've tried millions of things. Millions? Number them, name them. 
Well, maybe tens of thousands. Tens of thousands? Name a thousand. Well, maybe a hundred. Name a hundred. Well, maybe I did these two things over and over again that don't work. Okay? But when we start saying, I've tried everything, we tend to encant that, don't we? We make it an incantation, and then we believe it. And since we think we've tried everything, we just give up. That's garbage. Not true. Hey, let me ask you a question. How long would you give your average baby to learn how to walk? You know, before you shut them off and didn't let them try anymore. You go, what are you, crazy? My kid's going to keep trying until he or she walks. Ah, magic formula. You know, when almost everything in the whole world walks. Okay? So this is the ultimate success formula. It comes down to knowing what you want, why you want it, taking massive action, knowing what's working, and simply changing your approach until you get it. That's it. Anyone who succeeds does this. They may not call it Robin's ultimate success formula, but I guarantee they did it. I mean, corny example, Thomas Edison, these lights in here. Did this guy know his outcome, yes or no? Yes or no? He was absolutely clear without knowing the outcome. He couldn't have built that in a million years. It didn't exist before. He had to decide he wanted to create this result without the use of candles. Did he know why he wanted to do it? You bet. You read his writings. This man had a sense of incredible purpose and drive. Did he take massive action, yes or no? Oh, yes. Tens of thousands of experiments. Did he notice when it wasn't working and learn from it, yes or no? Did he keep changing his approach? That's why right now in this room we don't smell candlelight. Right? Now, if you know the old story of him, it's written about him early in his early days. He says he's got his best friend with him. He's doing this experiment, and as he's doing it, he creates a small explosion, which shakes the room, scares both of them very, very severely. And then at the end of that, he gets up, and his friend is totally shaken, freaked out. He pulls out his journal, and he starts writing. And his buddy says to him, what's the matter with you insane? You almost killed us. So you're going to wait till you have 10,000 failures before you give this stupid idea up? And Edison's response to him was, I didn't have a failure there. He goes, that's your 9,999th failure. He said, no, it's not. He said, I discovered the 9,999th way not to invent the electric light bulb. But I did discover how to create a small explosion, which may be useful in the future somewhere else. Uh, interesting, right? Because he understood what this process was. Hey, did Bruce Springsteen use this? Do you think he just went out and used his gravelly voice and said, hey, baby, born to USA, and everybody went, yeah, you're it, man. Is that what happened? No. What really happened, if you know his story, was that all the agents and people he went to try and book with said, just play the guitar and keep your mouth shut. Your voice is gross sounding. It's gravelly. It's irritating. No one's going to like the stuff. Keep your mouth shut and play the guitar. But he knew what he wanted. He had all the drive you can imagine. He knew why he wanted. Took massive action. Kept changing his approach until he got what he wanted. How about uh, Sly Stallone, Sylvester Stallone, Rocky? Rocky's story is this even, right? But Sly's is too. Sly's a good friend of mine. And when I first met him years ago, he's listening to my tapes and stuff, and he invited me over for dinner, and we started talking. And I said, you know, I've heard your story from other people, but I really love to hear it from the horse's mouth. I don't know how much is mythology, you know, urban myth, and how much is true. So he told me his whole story. He said the essence of it, though, was he said he knew his whole life what he wanted to do since he was very, very young. He wanted to be in the movie business, period. I mean, not just TV, movies. And he, just, he said why was... For him, it was a chance to have people not only escape, but to inspire people. And by the way, that drive is what made most of his movies, inspire people to what they're capable of, to overcome unbelievable obstacles, because in his own life, he felt like he did that. When he was born, he was pulled out by the forceps. That's why he looked the way he did. That's why he talked the way he did. And he said, so I really want to do that. And he said, I knew why I want to do it, and I wasn't willing to settle for anything else. And he said, what happened was, I went out to try and get jobs, and it's not like I went, hey, Adrian, they went, you, you're a star. It didn't work out real well. They looked at me and said, hey, you're stupid looking. Do something else. You know, what is it talking like this? There's no place for you in that stuff. You're never going to be a star in the movies. You're insane. No one's going to want to listen to somebody who looks dopey and talks out of the side of their mouth. Right? And he got no after no after no after no. He said, I was thrown out more, more than 1,500 times of agents' offices in New York. I said, there aren't 1,500 agents in New York. He said, I know. I've been to them five, six, seven, eight, nine times. He said, remember one guy, I went in there, and I got in there at 4 o'clock, and he wouldn't see me, so I stayed there, and I would not leave. And I stayed overnight. He came back the next morning, I was still sitting there. He said, that's how I got my first job. The guy said, fine, come in here. And he sat down, and he went through this, and he gave me my first movie. I said, oh, really? I thought Rocky was your first movie. He said, no, this other movie, I'd never heard of it. He said, I said, well, what character did you play? He said, well, I was in it for about 20 seconds. I was a thug that somebody beat up. He said, because they made me feel like, you know, somebody, people hate your guts. You getting beat up, it'll be a good thing. And he did like three movies like that. 
Never got anything. Kept going out. Rejection, rejection, rejection. So finally he realized it wasn't working. So he changed his approach. He said, I was starving, by the way. He said, I couldn't pay for even to have heat in my apartment. My wife was screaming at me every day to go get a job. I said, well, why didn't you? He said, because I knew that if I got a job, he said, I'd get seduced back and I'd lose my hunger. He said, I knew that the only way I could do this is if it was the only choice, if I burned all of the bridges. Because if I did a normal job, pretty soon I'd be caught up in that rhythm and that stuff and I'd feel okay about my life and I feel like my dream would just gradually disappear. He said, I wanted to keep that hunger. That hunger was the only thing I thought was my advantage. He said, my wife didn't understand that at all. He said, we'd have these vicious fights. And he said, it was freezing. So I was broke, we had no money. And he said, so I finally went to the public library one day because it was warm. He said, I didn't want to read anything. So I went in, New York Public Library. He said, I was hanging out there and I sat down in this chair and somebody left a book there. And he said, I, I looked down at this book and it were the poems of Edgar Allan, stories of Edgar Allan Poe. And he said, so I started reading it. And he said, I got totally into Edgar Allan Poe. And he said, I know everything about it. And he goes on for another 20 minutes telling me about Edgar Allan Poe. He knows everything, how he died, what it was about, what really happened. And I said, well, what did Poe do for you? He said, Poe got me out of myself. He got me to think about how I could touch other people and not worry about myself so much. And he said, maybe you decide to become a writer. I said, just imagine Rocky the writer, right? And he said, so I tried to write a bunch of screenplays. Nothing worked, nothing worked. I was totally broke. He said, I didn't even have 50 bucks. And he said, and finally, he said, I sold a script. It was called Paradise Alley. He said, it's a movie I made many years later, but I sold it. And he said, I sold it for 100 bucks. He said, but 100 bucks was a ton of money, man. I was so thrilled. And I thought, I'm on my way. But it never led to anything. And he said, so finally, he said, I kept going and going and going. He said, finally, we were so broke. He said, I hawked my wife's jewelry. He said, Tony, there's some things in life you should never do. He said, that was basically the end of our relationship. She hated my gut so much. He said, now we were so broke, we had nothing, no food, no money. And he said, the one thing I love most in the world was my dog. He said, I love my dog because he gave me unconditional love, unlike my wife. And he said, so what happened was, though, we were so broke that to survive, I couldn't even feed my dog. So I went to a liquor store. He said, it was the lowest day of my life. And I stood outside the liquor store trying to sell my dog to strangers. He said, I tried to sell my dog for 50 bucks. And he said, this, finally, this one guy negotiated with me and bought my dog for me, my best friend on earth, for $25. He said, I walked away from there and I cried. He said, it was the worst thing that ever happened in my life. He said, two weeks later, I'm watching a fight between Muhammad Ali and Weppner, this white guy that's getting bludgeoned but just keeps on coming even though he gets the hell beat out of him. And he said, I got an idea. He said, I, as soon as the fight ended, I started writing. He said, I wrote for 20 straight hours. I did not sleep. I wrote the entire movie in 20 hours straight. Right then, saw the fight, wrote the movie, whole thing, done. He said, I was shaking at the end. I was so excited. He said, I really knew, man. I knew what I wanted. I knew why I wanted it. He said, just like you teach that formula. He said, but I said, man, I took the action. Now it's time to deliver. And so he said, I went out and started trying to sell it to agents. And they all would read it. And they'd say, you know, this is predictable. This is stupid. This is sappy. He said, I wrote down all the things they said. And I read them the night of the Oscars when we won. Right? He said, it was really good, right? The greatest revenge is massive success. <laughs> and he said, so what happened was, he said, I kept going, trying to sell it, trying to sell it, nobody going, I'm broke, I'm starving. He said, finally, I meet these guys, they read it, and they believe in the script, and they love it. And they offer me $125,000 for my script. I said, oh my God, you must have been out of your mind. He said, I was. I said, just one thing, though, guys, you got a deal based on one thing. And they said, what's that? He said, i got a star in it. They went, Pfft. What are you talking about? You're a writer. He said, no, no, I'm an actor. He said, no, 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 you're a writer. He said, no, no, I'm an actor. That is my story, and I'm Rocky. He said, I got to play it. You know, I got to be the head person. I got to be the starring role. And they said, there's no way. We're not going to pay you $125,000, take some no name and stick you in that and throw our money away. We need a star, you know? And they want to have Ryan O'Neal play Rocky to give you a picture. Can you imagine? <laughs> That's who they picked, right? And so he said, no way, Ryan O'Neal isn't Rocky, I'm Rocky, went through this whole thing, right? They finally, he said, they said, well, take it or leave it. He said, I left the room. I said, if that's what you believe, you don't get my script, and he left. Here's a man with no money, none, totally broke, offered $125,000, more money than seen in his lifetime, and he walked away because he knew his real what? Knew his real what? And why he wanted, he was committed to it. So he said, they called him a few weeks later, and they came and brought him back, and they offered him a quarter of a million dollars not to star in his own movie. He turned it down, $250,000.
They came back, their final offer was $325,000. They wanted this thing. He said, not without me, and they said no. They finally compromised, and they gave him $35,000 and points in the movie, because they said, if this is going to happen, then you're going to take the risk with us. And the bottom line is, we don't think it'll work, but at least we won't spend a bunch of money on you. And they only spent a million dollars to make Rocky, and it grossed $200 million at the time. I, I mean, it was done pretty well. But what's interesting about this is, here's, I said, what'd you do? I mean, even 35000 it's not a quarter of a million. That's a lot of money when you don't have 25 bucks. I said, what's the first thing you did? I figured you went out and partied or something. He said, I went to that liquor store for three straight days and hoped that the man who had my dog frequented the store. He said, because I want to buy back my dog. I thought that was so cool, right? That was really cool. I said, what happened? He said, third day I was there, this guy walks by, and I see him, and I can't believe it, and there's my dog. And I looked at him, and I said, sir, remember me? And he said, it had been about a month and a half by the time this had all come about. And he said, remember me? You know, I'm the guy who sold you the dog. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I love the dog. He said, look. He said, I was so broke, I was starving. He's my best friend. I'm sure you love him too, but i got to have him black. Please, I beg of you. He said, I'll pay you $100 for the dog. I know you paid me $25, but I'll give you $100. And the man said, absolutely not. No way. It's my dog now. You can't buy him back. I, and Sly said, you know, Tony, you know how you say, know your outcome? I said, yeah. He said, I knew it. And he said, I kept changing my approach. So I went, $500 for the dog. The guy said, absolutely no way. He said, $1,000 for my dog. The guy said, no amount of money on earth is ever going to get this dog for you. I said, what'd you do? He said, I knew my outcome, right? Because he listened to these tapes, kept doing them. He said, I decided to take massive action. He said, I got my dog. I just kept changing my approach, so I got it. I said, what'd it cost you? $15,000 and a part in Rocky. The guy's in Rocky.